at the University of Chicago School of Medicine studies the effect of sleep on the body. So we're going to do your vitals. At her lab, healthy young volunteers like Jonathan Rock are paid to come one at a time and have virtually every system in their bodies monitored while their sleep is interfered with. We did a study where we restricted sleep to four hours per night for six nights. Six nights. And we noticed that they were already in a pre-diabetic state. And so that was a big finding. And these were perfectly healthy people. Yes, they were young, they were healthy, they were fit. On the road to diabetes in just six days. And that's not all. They were also hungry. Van Cotter has made a radical discovery that lack of sleep may be contributing to the epidemic of obesity in this country through the work of a hormone called leptin that tells your brain when you're full. We observed that the volunteers, they actually had a drop in leptin levels. So leptin so was... So they got hungrier. Yes. Leptin was telling the brain, time to eat, we need more food. But Even in though fact, they, they had plenty of food. Several large-scale studies from all over the world have reported a link between short sleep times and obesity, as well as heart disease, high blood pressure, and stroke. I think it tells us that... Um, you know, sleep deprivation is not a challenge for which biology has wired us. There's no other mammal that sleep deprived itself than the human. So it is read by our biology as a stress. You know, it, 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 our attitude about sleep flies in the face of what you're saying. Because I think that you don't need as much sleep as looked upon as something very positive. Yes, it's seen as a badge of honor. Or even a mark of health in a funny way. But, you know, I find it amazing to see how many people are asleep uh, within five minutes of boarding an airplane at 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, sit down and boom. Uh, it's, uh, it shouldn't happen. A normal adult shouldn't be falling asleep at 11 o'clock in the morning, minutes after sitting in a small and comfortable airplane seat. It just shows that, you know, people are exhausted. Right now I feel okay, um, a little drowsy. Jonathan hasn't been told exactly what's being tested during his stay here. He just knows on day five that he's feeling kind of groggy. The lights kind of make me drowsy. and um, The lights? Yeah, they're on all day, so I just want to close my eyes, basically. He thinks it's the lights, but that's because they aren't telling him about the sounds. Unbeknownst to Jonathan, each night when he falls into what should be a restful slumber, he's actually entering into an eight-and-a-half-hour battle. His opponent, Dr. Esra Tasali, a colleague of Van Cotter, who is watching him and his brain waves from a small control room across the hall and blasting sounds through speakers on both sides of his bed. It's that loud in the room? Yes. In this experiment, the idea is not to interfere with the quantity of Jonathan's sleep, but the quality. Soon after he falls asleep, Jonathan's body naturally wants to enter into what's called deep sleep. But Dasali is determined to stop him without waking him up. Every time his brain starts producing what are called delta waves, indicating the start of deep sleep. Delta waves are starting. They look like mountains. Exactly. OK, here they come. She searches her arsenal of sounds and attacks. He doesn't budge. No. And he goes right back into an, the sleep you want him to be in. During a normal night, we cycle through different stages of sleep, progressing from light into deep sleep, then into REM or dream sleep, and back again. As we age, though, the amount of time we spend in deep sleep decreases. Van Cotter and Tassali are investigating a novel theory that some of the health problems we typically associate with old age may in fact be caused by the loss of deep sleep. When you say old, what age are we talking about? We lose deep sleep at a very early age. So an, a young, healthy uh, person may have 100 minutes of deep sleep. And at 50 years old, it may be as little as 20 minutes. So it really ooh, goes down very quickly. Oh, here it goes. 
So Tasali's goal is to turn 19-year-old Jonathan sleepwise into a 70-year-old. I can't believe he doesn't wake up with that racket. He woke up with that one. How are you? The next morning, 346 sounds later. How was last night? Last night? Last night was OK. Woke up a few times, I think, or something. Okay. It's time for testing. You're all done with the prep? Now Jonathan's going to have fat extracted from his body for analysis, go through a PET scan to see how his brain is metabolizing sugar, and between procedures, he's answering questions about how he feels. His doctors assure us that Jonathan will be fine once he goes back to his normal sleep routine. But after four nights without deep sleep, they have found that, like prior study subjects, he is hungrier, less alert, and most importantly, his body is no longer able to metabolize sugar effectively, putting him temporarily at increased risk for type 2 diabetes. We usually think of diabetes as something that's a disease of old age, but really it may be a disease of sleep deprivation. I would say that sleep deprivation may be a new risk factor for diabetes. Not just aging. Not just aging, not just being overweight or obese, not just having a family history of diabetes, which are the three major risk factors, but this is an added one. And we have really an epidemic of diabetes now, and that type 2 diabetes is now occurring in children and in adolescents. And you know, adolescents and children too are also being sleep deprived. Maybe high schoolers are amongst the most sleep deprived individuals in, in our society because they have an enormous sleep need, nine to 10 hours, yet they sleep less than seven hours per night. She says this research proves we all need to rethink what we consider essential for good health. You always hear about diet and exercise, and that's where it ends. And you're saying it should always be diet, exercise, and sleep. Definitely. So if lack of sleep impacts our appetite, our metabolism, our memory, and how we age, is there anything it doesn't affect? How about sex? How did you... Scientist Scott McRobert at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia is asking that very question of fruit flies. There's one fly in here. We keep our males where... separately. This is a male fly. You can almost not see him. He's so small. Where is he? Oh, there he is. I'm going to suck him up in this. We watched as McRobert used this bizarre contraption to suck the drosophila, that means fruit fly, out of the vial and put him into this little dish with a female. Did you get him? Yeah. McRobert gave us a play-by-play -play of the action. Okay, so now the female's walking around the outside of the chamber and right. the male's in the center and you see he's orienting toward her. Everywhere she goes, oh, he's following her. If you watch closely, he'll touch her with his front legs. It's hard to see, but he will, and he'll sing. Here comes the song. Flies sing, he told me, by lifting one wing to the side and vibrating it up and down. It's like an off-key humming, and it's got little taps in it. That's singing right there. He's actually trying to get her to slow down a little bit. She doesn't like him. McRobert is doing a study to see whether sleep deprivation in fruit flies affects mating. He's had his regular amount of sleep. Exactly. They both have, actually. And when he's in the presence of a sexually attractive female, he's just courting and doing almost nothing else. I don't know who I'm feeling sorry for here. Poor guy, he's been working at this. He's working very she, hard. She wants to get away from him. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, watch, it's about to happen. Okay. How can you tell it's about to happen? I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what are you seeing that's telling you? Here we go. She's almost not moving now. That's it. They're mating. They're mating. Oh, my goodness. Believe it or not, they will keep this up for more than 15 minutes. But now, take a look at a pair of flies where the male has been deprived of sleep. You can actually see the difference. He was courting a second ago, but he doesn't stay with her. Oh, he's, he's now not. sort of standing still. Look at him. Cleaning his, his front legs. How do you know he's not trying to go to sleep? Well, we don't. That may be exactly what he's trying to do. Here he goes. It's obviously different than... Now, there's a little bit of courtship there. He's orienting toward her, and his wings are flicking a little bit. But, but now, see, he backs off. He doesn't maintain it. McRobert told us the sleep-deprived flies rarely, if ever, mate. 
even though you're not sure how to make an analogy to men, if any are watching, nevertheless, <laughs> this well, could be somewhat of a lesson. If you want to take this to the level of humans, and this is something that geneticists rarely do if they're, intel if they're smart, and I probably shouldn't do it either, the take-home lesson is get enough sleep. Yeah. I mean, the successful male Drosophila is a Drosophila that gets enough sleep. So at least for now, it looks like we're stuck sleeping a third of our lives away. Humans love to keep asking, can't we just get rid of sleep? If you had a poll in the United States and said, if we could safely eliminate half of the time you sleep and you'd be, you wouldn't suffer any deficit, you'd be good to go, we could just magically make sleep go away, how many people would want it? And I believe you'd find the population votes easily overwhelmingly for it. And yet I think the hedonic joy of sleeping and how good it feels. Hedonic joy? Well, I meant pleasure, okay? Pleasure, okay. <laughs> I would have to say that consciousness, wake consciousness, is probably a bit overrated. Do you think we're going to figure out a way to get along with less sleep? I hope not. You don't think that's where research should put its effort? You know, Leslie, my, my impression is that sleep affects so many aspects of mental and physical function that there's not going to be one magic bullet drug that will be able to compensate. Much better idea is simply to sleep an hour or more. Well, what about an afternoon cat nap? Some research is showing that what counts is getting your seven and a half to eight hours total. So naps do help. But not all the scientists are convinced that that's as good as sleeping straight through the night.